Good morning, boys and girls and everyone. Welcome back to Read Aloud with me. Today is Tuesday, May 5th, and I am glad to be back here with you to read some really great stuff. We left off on the chapter called Price of Friendship. And Sydney and her new friend, Original Sydney, they just left the pool. And I'm not sure if Cindy is really connecting with this original Sydney. I think there's a lot of differences between them, but can they still be friends? Let's find out. What have you done? My mom yells at me as soon as I walk through the door. What do you mean? You look like a radish. I was at the pool, I remind her. How did you get so sunburned swimming? We didn't swim. What did you do? We tanned, I confess. I know what's coming next. This is the stupidest thing a girl can do. Why would you do that? So here's one more thing that's different about me. And I ran. Pale skin is considered beautiful. Nobody's tan. If anything, women avoid the sun. But what am I supposed to do? I live in California where pale skin means you need a tan. The only reason I let you go to the pool with your friend is because I thought you were swimming and you know, that makes you tall, my mom says. My parents actually believe that swimming or riding a bicycle makes a person grow more. That's why the first thing they bought me when we moved to America was a bike. That's also why I took swimming lessons at YWCA in Compton to swim and get tall. My mom thinks she's short because she didn't swim or bike when she was a kid. I'm sorry, my mom, I say. That's a total lie. I'm not sorry at all. My mom does not understand that sometimes there is a price for friendship. This is why she has no friends in America. She doesn't try doing anything that American moms do. She wants to have the same life she did in Iran. And even I know this is not possible. So she just watches TV and frankly, I don't think TV counts as a friend. I may be sunburnt and in pain, but I now have a friend. I guess, like the title says, it's the price of friendship. All right, next chapter. The Captain and Me. The next day, someone knocks on our door and my dad answers. I hear original Sydney asking if I'm home, then my dad's voice, wait, please. Zamarad! Zamarad! I run down the stairs as fast as I can. Why does my dad have to yell loud enough for all of North America to hear? Now I'm going to have to explain my name change to original Sydney. Thankfully, she doesn't seem phased by the strange sounds coming out of my dad's mouth. We walk to her house, and when we get there, I'm ready to say hello to her parents like I'm supposed to. It's very quiet. Where are your parents, I asked. They're not home, she says casually, like this is a normal thing. What happened to them? I asked, trying not to sound too scared. They're at work. Oh boy, this is not good. There is no way my parents would allow me to be here if they knew. This is much worse than tanning. I start making a list in my head of everything that could go wrong, starting with fires, burglaries, and earthquakes. Right, when I get to kidnapping, original Sydney suggests we go upstairs. I'll just stay for a little bit, I tell myself. We sit on the floor in her room on the red shag carpet. She puts on the cassette of Love Will Keep Us Together and starts singing along. She knows all the words. Since I claim that this is also my favorite song, I move my head from side to side, repeating the words, Love will keep us together. Whenever they came up, which is often. For the rest of the lyric, I just close my eyes and hum quietly, pretending like I'm singing in my head. Ain't gonna be there whenever. After rewinding the cassette and listening to the song three times in a row, original Sydney decides it's time to go play with the kittens, Captain and Tennel. They're fluffy and tiny and unfortunately not very friendly. As soon as I started playing with them, Captain scratches my hand. Ouch, I yell, covering the wound in my other hand. I need a band-aid and some neosporin. For that? She points to my hand. Yes, it hurts, and I don't want to get an infection. The original Sydney starts to laugh. That's nothing. Can I just have some neosporin? I ask again. What is that? She asks. I can't believe she basically lives in a zoo and has never heard of neosporin. 
It keeps you from getting infections, so you don't need penicillin, I tell her. Well, we don't have any, and I don't know what the other pencil whatever is either. Penicillin, I said. I don't even bother explaining what it is, especially since I have learned about it in a book. It was a story about a Belgian family who moved to Africa and father, and the father got sick. That's also how I learned about testis flies, which I'm also not going to bring up. Whatever she said, letting Tanil lick her face, I guess you'll never own a cat. No. That's too bad. My parents are barely ever home, so they let me have as many pets as I want. I go to the stables after school to do my homework and then ride magic. I've never in my entire life been home alone. Where are your parents? I ask, still covering my wound. They have an insurance business, she says. It's all about prevention and planning ahead. My parents would be happy to talk to your parents, but all their insurance needs. I almost choked. Her parents cannot meet my parents until I've known her long enough to tell her that I'm from Iran. And my name really isn't Sydney. If they meet before that, her parents will hear my parents' accents and ask where we're from. Then my dad will start talking about the oil industry and my mom will start saying something that makes no sense. I guess I just don't like people to meet my parents. I know that sounds bad. It's not like I don't love them. I just want to hide them until they stop being embarrassing. Thank you, I say, but we don't have any insurance needs. Everyone has insurance needs, she says. Not us, I reply. I'm trying to figure out her next question before she asks it, but then she says, let me show you Mark's room. He'll be starting up boarding school in Hawaii soon, so you can sleep in his bed if you ever want to stay over. That's one thing I like about original Sydney. Just when I think, how am I going to answer her next question, she moves on to something else. Mark's room is indeed filled with posters of Mick Jagger. I imagine Mick Jagger to be handsome, but he's not handsome at all. He looks like a girl and not even a cute one, but I'm glad I know who he is now, just like every other kid in America. So it sounds like original Sydney's parents are super duper busy and never home to hang out with Sydney. So they, bought her all these pets. It's definitely much different from what Sormaron is used to. What happened to your hand? Next chapter, chapter, Lucky Dogs. What happened to your hand? My dad asked when he comes home that night. I knew this was coming. Cindy's kitten scratched it. I say, he takes a deep breath. So Marad, you are lucky it was your hand and not your eyeball. I have known many people whose eyeballs were scratched out by cats. They are now learning to read with their fingers and they walk with canes, regretting that they ever tried to pet a cat. He pauses as if to let his words sink in. Then he continues, you should never play with cats, only look at them from a distance. What are the names of these people? I ask skeptically. It doesn't matter. Also, you should never let dogs lick you because you can get out one of those diseases that comes from lick being licked by dogs. Everyone in Compton got licked by dogs and nobody caused, caught any diseases, I reminded him. I know many people who did. Who? That's not the point, he says, a bit flustered. You don't find a lot of people in Iran who have pets in their homes. You would never find anyone with a big dog in the house. Dogs are kept outside. So another cultural difference. In America, we have pets, dogs and pet cats and we let them lick us and we play with them and we don't worry about a scratch. But in Iran, their culture is different. They believe that pets should be outside. The first time we went into American supermarket in Compton, we were going up and down the aisles and all of a sudden, whoa, a whole aisle of food for cats and dogs. And in Iran, most cats and dogs live on the streets and they're lucky if someone throws a scrap at them now and then. Most of the time they're on their own. In America, there's dog food for young dogs, old dogs, fat dogs, small dogs, active dogs, lazy dogs, and cats have choices like salmon, beef, or chicken flavored meals. I always thought cats would eat any food. Then I saw the cat food commercials on TV that showed cats that are insulted when they're served food that isn't moist enough. You see the cat turning around and walking away, tail in the air, disgusted. <laughs> Meanwhile, the owner is going nuts 
because of his pouting cow. So he buys the juicy and delicious chicken liver cat food in the can that he should have bought in the first place instead of the cheaper dry cat food. The animal is finally happy and the owner breathes a sigh of relief. I never seen a cat in Iran walk away from food even if their meal is not their first choice. They eat it because who knows when the next meal will come. Plus, if they don't eat their food, some other cat will for sure. My dad says that dogs and cats in America are luckier than most people in the world. It's kind of true. As Americans, we treat our pets as family, right? I laugh because of my cat, he is so spoiled. If I don't put down food he likes, he will stick his little tail up in the air and walk away disgusted. <laughs> Sultans of Suntan is our next chapter. Original Sydney has decided that for the entire month before school starts, we will work on our tans every other day. This puts me in an awkward position. I have always been a kid who tells the truth and now I don't know what to do. If I listen to my mom and refuse to tan, I will lose my only friend. So I lie to my mom and tell her I will be doing laps. She mentions that when I get tired of doing laps, I should hold on to the top of the pool and just kick. That will also lengthen my leg, she says. I feel terrible lying to her. So another cultural thing in Iran, paler or lighter skin, is more appealing and more attractive whereas in California people really really look to have a tan right on the way to the pool that afternoon I asked the original Sydney did you know I moved here from Compton but I'm not originally but I'm originally from Iran I speak Persian at home and did you know we write from right to left I didn't know that no, but one of the trainers at the stable, Scott, is from Compton, she says. You wouldn't believe what happens to his horse last year. And just like that, she launches into another story about horses. I can believe she doesn't ask me a single question about Iran or about writing from right to left. In Compton, I wrote my name in Persian on the chalkboard for show and tell and Bill Garrett yelled, you write backwards. Instead of listening to original Sydney, I pray silently, dear God, this is such a small matter compared to everything going on in the world, but can you please stop those horse stories? And just like that, the story ends, thank God. This is my chance to change the topic. We should call ourselves the Sultan Suntans, I suggest. What's a Sultan, she asks. A Sultan is like a ruler in Arabia. I love Arabian horses, she explains. Some people think magic is in Arabian, but she's not, even God can't stop these stories. I realize that original Sydney is a compass, but instead of pointing north, she points to horse stories. As boring as she is though, she's my only friend, so I listen and listen and listen. Plus I figure someday she will ask me a question about me. I mean, how many horse stories can one person have? I don't think even horses have that many stories about other horses. Two weeks into our tanning sessions, which my mom thinks are my swimming sessions, original Sydney comes to pick me up as usual. I go to the kitchen where we keep the precious pool fee in a drawer. I rifle through all the stuff in there, the mini flashlight, paper clips, rubber bands, extra batteries of all sizes, a yellow highlighter, a measuring tape, a glue stick, soy sauce packets and matches. Um, my heart starts to beat real fast. Ma'am, ma'am in, I yelled. Did you put the pool key somewhere else? My mother flies down the stairs faster than I thought she was capable of moving. Chi, she screamed. Kalide! Estoro Rogam Carli. What? Did you, did you lose the pool key? Usually in mystery novels, there are six questions, six possible suspects. And you have to wait until the last chapter to find out who is the guilty one. The novel, The Girl Who Lost the Pool Key, is very short with only one chapter. Original Sydney, who has been standing quietly beside me, speaks up. She's very brave, since my mom's face is turning a dark shade of red, the shade that the guidebook to my mood ring describes as passionate. I know that my friend's presence is the only thing keeping my mother from fully exploding. We can go look for it. We can put up signs, Original Sydney says, in a positive tone that does not exist in the world of angry Iranian parents at least not my mother's. Then before my mom can say anything or strangle me, we say goodbye and run next door. Okay, we are going to stop there. Let's hope that, uh, 
um, Cindy finds the pool key. So as you remember in the beginning of the book, the landlord was adamant about not losing that key or she would charge them money. So let's cross our fingers for Sydney or Zamarad. Um, we'll pick up next time to find if she finds to find out if she finds her key. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you friends soon. Toodles.